so excited to see you all here and to kick off the school year. I want to thank uh, Dean Davies uh, and Kate Duvall and everyone who made today possible, and also Dean Falk and everyone in his office who brought you here to us. Uh, I look around today and it is more crowded than it was on Friday, and uh, so I realize that some of you were not here on Friday. And I hate to repeat myself, but I, I will say, uh, I'm just going to repeat a little bit of what I said on Friday because I think it's important for everyone to hear uh, and so for those of you who are not here I want to say it which is this is a happy day and I am so excited we are all so excited that you are here but this last week and the events of last week were not uh, how we wanted to welcome you and I am profoundly sorry for that um, and I want to say that I can feel the excitement in the room, and I, I hope you're all feeling that to the extent that you aren't. Um, I hope you will seek out counsel and help and support from this uh, very supportive community. Uh, but I want to say that we are not what happened last weekend. Um, we are still, I think it's already clear to you, very much the place that you chose to go to law school uh, for the good reasons that you chose it. What happened last weekend and those who marched were all about uh, exclusion and anger and hatred and violence and bigotry and we here are all about joy humanity and love so we are all so glad that you are here and we chose each and every one of you uh, to be here for your whole selves who you are in all the different ways uh, that you uh, exist in the world all the different places you come from all of your different hopes and dreams every single one of you is a crucial part of who we are and what we do I don't want you to forget that and I want you to know that none of us will ever forget that so when I uh, think about our response as an institution to those events, I think that we respond both on the level of values and on the level of mission. And I talked on Friday about the values, how we reach across our differences to build community, to engage in respectful, empathetic dialogue, how we are one diverse, pluralistic, collegial community, and that this is one way for us to refute what happened last weekend, that we live our values, we all know we belong here, we own this community, we we respect each other and we do it all together. We are in this together. What I say for today and what I want to talk about at greater length is how our very mission uh, refutes and undermines the hatred, violence, and bigotry of last weekend's events. Our mission here at the University of Virginia Law School is to educate you as lawyers, to educate you as the best, most exceptional lawyers you can possibly be. And as lawyers, you will have the tools, the power, the skills, and the mindset to push back against violence and injustice and to make real change in the world. When I went to law school, that is certainly what I had in mind. I went to history graduate school and law school at the same time. I really wanted to study how legal change happened, and I also wanted to think about how to make change myself. Uh, when I first started studying how legal change happened, I was very focused on the role that regular, ordinary people play in legal change. And let me just say this, until about 10 minutes ago, you all in my book would have been regular, ordinary people, and no longer, no longer. Um, uh, but the, the very first paper that I wrote in law school that became my history dissertation that became my first book was about African-American teenagers across the South who were lured to Florida to harvest sugarcane during World War II and were virtually enslaved there. And the questions I wanted to ask about them was what happened to these teenagers? How did their parents argue for their release? Who did they argue to? What did they understand about their rights? What did they think could be done about the problems? These were important questions. And they're questions that I still ask, uh, in, important to recapture their stories and the stories and lives of everyday people, their hardships, and the efforts that they made on their own behalf. But it quickly became clear to me as I started working uh, on my dissertation that their story did not end with them that once they made their complaints and wrote their letters and showed up at FBI offices, lawyers became involved. They complained to the Department of Justice and they complained to the NAACP. They complained to white lawyers and they complained to back black lawyers. And those relationships were key because the lawyers transformed their stories and transformed what could be done with their stories. The lawyers decided whether to take their cases or not take their cases. They decided what kind of arguments they would make about them. So the lawyers facilitated facilitated, mediated, and even sometimes thwarted the claims of the people who hope to be their clients. 
I was already in law school when I realized that my work had to go from the regular people to the lawyers. And I, I have to say, it's embarrassing, but I was already in law school and I hadn't yet fully appreciated the power of lawyers. And that's the power that I want to convey to you today, that the power of lawyers is critical to the voices of regular people. It's critical to enabling them to achieve their goals, to change the world. It's not to say regular people don't make change. They do it all the time. We saw it here last weekend. Um, but I have come to think, and this is the calling I have, this is why I stand here today, that that what lawyers do to amplify and facilitate that change is just crucial. So I became a scholar of lawyers and not just of regular people and not just of the law. Cases exist because real people experience real harms that they think lawyers can help them with. So my focus has been on the power that lawyers, or lawyers wield in response to those problems. I've since written a second book thinking about how lawyers saw a problem in the world that people brought to them that no one had thought was a legal problem and constructed it into a legal problem and then went about solving it. What is really striking about the lawyers that I study is that for the most part, they are not famous and they are not unique. I am not just talking about Thurgood Marshall or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I am saying that all lawyers wield this power and all lawyers have the capacity to wield it all the time. So what is this power? What is it that we are preparing you to do? We are preparing you to make law. Law affects real people, institutions, companies, nations. The law unlocks doors and it enforces contracts. It puts people in prison and gets them out again. It allows for treaties and it ends wars. It merges companies and it allows them to go bankrupt. And of course, the law doesn't do any of these things without lawyers. You are about to spend hours and hours a day. I heard about Dean Davies' schedule. It's a good one. <laughs> hours and hours a day reading cases written by judges. And the judges don't often talk about what the lawyers say or how the cases came to them. But the law doesn't get to the judges pre-made. People have made it for them before it gets there. And behind every case that you read are lawyers on both sides. The law exists as part of the larger world, as part of social life and politics and economics and the community and culture. The law is not found, sorry, the law is not found, it is made, and it will, I am happy to say, eventually, routinely, and momentously be made by you. So I am acutely aware that as a law professor of 14 years and as a dean of one, my job is to make sure that you all understand your power and that you are equipped to deploy it with integrity and responsibility. So how will that happen? How will you go from the lay people you are 10 minutes ago <laughs> to the lawyers you are about to become. You will be initiated into a new language, a set of forms and processes, and powerful institutions that you will know how to move. That's law school, right? That's what you're here to do. There are three parts, in my view, to the legal education you're about to undertake. The first part is the one that I imagine you've spent the most time thinking about. And that is the doctrinal part of your education. And that's the part that you will focus on this semester intensively. Thinking like a lawyer, people say that all the time, right? What does it mean to think like a lawyer? It means you can analyze problems. You can understand and manipulate categories. You can reason with clarity. We lawyers are often accused of being argumentative. But it's not that we're argumentative. It's that we are persuasive. <laughs> Our goal is to persuade, not to disagree. Uh, so thinking like a lawyer, the doctrinal building blocks of what you're about to learn, that is crucial, fundamental. That is your first task, and that is what you are going to be tackling over this next semester. But it's not the only piece of your education. And I want to put in the back of your heads now how to think about the other two pieces as you go forward. The second piece is the experiential learning, the skills-based learning that teaches integrity, responsibility, and judgment. These are the clinics, the externships, the pro bono projects, the negotiations courses, the summer jobs, alternative spring break, legal research and writing, classes on oration and public speaking. These are the classes where you will learn real skills, where you will interact with the real world, where you will have real clients, and where you will learn empathy. These are the classes that many of you will think of and many employers will think of as preparing you to hit the ground running, and they will do that. 
but they will do much more than that. They will give you the soft skills that you need beyond critical thinking. There's the critical thinking, and then there's when do you make that slam dunk argument, right? How do you figure out when is the best time for someone to be able to listen? And maybe it's not now, and maybe it's later, and it's working with clients and working in groups of students and working with people in the world and real lawyers that will enable you to understand how to deploy the thinking like a lawyer skills that you have learned. The third part of your education will consist of courses in a wide array of, of scholarly perspectives that will foster big picture thinking that are so critical to leadership. I want you to be able to put the world into larger perspective, interpersonal perspective. Why is this deal on the table now? What is the economic context? What is the political context? Why has this social movement erupted into the public spotlight right now? We have people on the law school faculty who are experts in history, jurisprudence, economics, psychology, politics, philosophy, religion, society, and more in addition to being experts on the law, and you should take advantage of them. We also have a whole university that you can take advantage of, and I urge you to do so, because we are preparing you for that first day of work and to hit the ground running, and we are also preparing you for a very long career, decades long, where we hope that the education you receive here will continue to pay dividends, that you will continue to think about it, and can you continue to have aha moments that come not only out of the doctrinal and experiential classes, but out of these big picture classes uh, that will enable you to have greater perspective. So my hope is that you will learn to think not only about manipulating set legal categories, but also about taking ownership over what the law most fundamentally is. That you will learn to think not only about what needs to be done, but what can or should be done, not only to practice the law, but to lead it. In order to achieve that mastery, you have to think about your education as a partnership, separate and apart from orientation, where you are largely passive recipients of information. <laughs> I do not want you to think of yourselves as passive recipients of information or mere consumers of what we feed you. I think you need to be active participants in the process of your education so that you can become masters of the law and the power that it exercises. The best compliment that I ever received in a teaching evaluation I received in constitutional law, uh, and it stays with me and, and makes me feel good all the time, and this was that this was not just a class, but a downright deep experience. And I think that is what all of law school should be, a downright deep experience, where you learn and are challenged, where you challenge yourselves, where you seek ownership and mastery so that you can become the people who truly make the law. So if the law is power and you are being taught to wield it, there are two things that come with that, opportunity and responsibility. So first, opportunity. You can do literally everything and anything you want to be. I think what, I, I, you have to dream big. I say all the time, and I, I say this about all the various th things that we do in this law school, we are in the business of making your hopes and dreams come true. And that is so exciting. Uh, Careers are long and varied. Uh, Zane Meminger will talk in a moment about his own career. And life is long, and no two careers and no two lives are the same. And this is your chance, your opportunity, to prepare yourself for the whole long, wide-ranging career that will follow. And it will be amazing, and it will be wondrous. And I know that, even if you're not sure. Even if you are sitting there wondering if you're in the right place and if you belong here, I, let me just tell you, you are and you do. And I know that because Cordell chose you. Uh, and I also know that, and you chose us, and I also know that because I know those who have come before you. I know those who clerk for judges and who practice in nonprofits or in government or in firms, who are the CEOs of hedge funds and the heads of legal aid societies, who are US attorneys like Zane Meminger, who are judges and Congress people and senators and presidents. You can even become, if you want, from this law school, a New York Times puzzle master like Will Shorts, who gave our graduate graduation speech two years ago. But seriously, being a lawyer comes, up, comes not only with power and all of these choices, but also choices about how to wield that power. And this is the responsibility part. In what realm, on whose behalf, to what ends. For some of you, I imagine, the events of last weekend will deeply influence your time here, how you think about that power and how you direct it. 
For others, I'm sure you've already come here with ideas about what you want to do, knowing where you want to head, and that will remain the same. Some of you, don't be chagrined by this, think you know where you're going, and that will change too. That certainly has happened to me. And for others still, you're sitting here thinking, really, there are people who know what they want to do? I don't know what I want to do. That's fine too. These are all good ways of being in the world. Uh, and knowing that you have the power to use your law degree as you want and making, making it your business to exercise that power how you think you should uh, is part of the process of going to law school. You don't have to have those answers now. Your answers can change over time. So let me talk a little bit more about responsibility, which is the cognate to power and opportunity. The law is not just a job, it is a learned profession. And that means that you are entrusted with the knowledge of the law and given a license to practice it and to hold a monopoly in practicing it. That means you hold a public trust to do public good and to fulfill public obligations as well as to work for private gain and personal glory. There are so many paths to fulfill that public obligation. There is no single path. But all paths flow through your understanding of yourselves as holders of this trust, as active participants in the law, and thus in the governance and leadership of American society and our larger global community. There is no better place than here to become this lawyer, this lawyer to access to every opportunity who understands the power of the law and exercises it responsibly. And that is true for all the reasons you know, all the reasons you read on our website, our fabulous faculty, our deeply impressive students, our amazing staff to guide you through this entire educational and professional process, and our incredible curriculum. It's a lot of adjectives again. Uh, but I really truly believe those things. I am excited about what you are about to experience. But it's more than that. It's that the faculty, the staff, the students, and our alumni are all engaged in a shared enterprise beyond the formal curriculum, beyond the professionalization process. And this goes back to the values that I discussed earlier. We are all engaged in a shared enterprise that never loses the sight, loses sight of the importance of humanity, respect, and relationships to both the educational process and the workings of the law. In other words, becoming a lawyer is about what goes on both inside the classroom and outside of it. That you will emerge here a better lawyer and a better person, a lawyer with judgment, perspective, imagination, dignity, integrity, empathy, and leadership. I've long felt the privilege of teaching law at this law school for those very reasons, and I feel it even more as dean. My son asked me uh, as I was uh, going through the dean uh, search process uh, when we were walking down the halls one day and a student said hi to me if that was my student, if he was one of my students. And my initial instinct was to say no uh, because I hadn't actually taught that student. And I paused, actually this was after, uh, after the process was over and I already knew I was going to be dean but wasn't dean yet. And I paused and I said, you know what, that was the wrong answer. Um, they're all my students. They're all my students now, and that is how I feel about you, and I hope you know that. Uh, I have met many of you already, but not all of you, and I'm excited uh, to call you my students and for, uh, uh, for you to know that I am here as your dean. Um, I'm sad that I cannot call Zane Memager my student, uh, but I am proud to call him one of our own and to call all of the UVA family our own. People sometimes laugh at me when I talk this way. My kids say I'm like Leslie Nope in a good way. Um, <laughs> And my husband jokes that I love lawyers. Many of you have met my husband, and uh, he likes to joke. Uh, and he would know that I love lawyers since he's one, and I married him, so it's true. Um, uh, but I will say that after more than a decade of being a lawyer, of teaching lawyers, of writing about lawyers, and now leading an institution where we educate the best and the brightest lawyers, I think I know lawyers pretty well, and I do love lawyers. And I have a pretty good feeling about all of you. It's not just love, it's also faith. And I know this is hokey and makes me sound like Leslie Lope, but I believe in lawyers, and I believe that being the dean of this law school is both a privilege and a responsibility. I believe in the power of the law, and I believe in a legal education that prepares you for every opportunity you can imagine and every responsibility you will encounter. I believe in you. My 15 years at this law school have only reinforced uh, and reaffirmed my beliefs and my witnessing the events of last weekend and my determination that they should not ever occur again and my hopes about the lasting change that we will make in the world together in their wake. 
reconfirm that this is a very special place to begin what I know will be truly incredible, life-changing, successful, and meaningful careers. And I welcome you to the UVA family. Thank you. <laughs>